Hi, I'm P.A. Bennett, and this is Palmetto Scene. The presidential primary campaigns are still full steam ahead. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton continue to be the front runners. Charles Bierbauer sat down with two-time Pulitzer Prize winner and Washington Post columnist Jim Hoagland to discuss where the candidates stand at this point in the election. Jim Hoagland is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, once for his reporting from overseas from South Africa and once for his commentary on foreign affairs written for the Washington Post from Washington. Jim, thanks to, for coming. It's good to have you with us. Um, with all that foreign perspective, let's talk politics from a foreign perspective. We're looking at a new American president next year. What are the foreign issues that that president's going to have to deal with? Well, this is an unusual campaign, Charles, in the sense that foreign policy is actually a subject of quite a lot of discussion, primarily because of the very unorthodox positions that Donald Trump is taking, uh, as juxtaposed to Hillary Clinton's broad experience in foreign affairs as Secretary of State. So voters will have a very distinct choice uh, when it comes to national security and foreign policy uh, in this election. And so there's a lot more interest than there usually is abroad at this stage in the American political scene. That presumes that Trump and Clinton are the nominees. We're not quite there yet, but, but it all seems to be heading that way. Start with Clinton first. How well respected is she overseas? I think she's known overseas as someone who knows her dossiers. She works hard on any given subject. Uh, she uh, traveled an incredible amount. She seemed to be quite competitive in that, too, uh, in, in terms Competi of... Competitive in what way? Logging miles mm -hmm. uh, as compared to Condoleezza Rice or other uh, secretaries of state uh, and calling attention to that fact. So building up that dossier as, as, as a potential presidential candidate... And, no and doubt. Be, and being able to say, I've been here, 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 and here? No doubt. Okay. What about... Uh, will, will, will the Benghazi incident, the deaths of the Americans at the consulate in, in Benghazi. Will that have a lingering effect on, on her election chances here and the perspective that foreign leaders would have of her? It's interesting that um, so far her Republican opponents have not been able to make a lot of mileage out of that. They haven't gotten a lot of traction. In fact, they awarded her a kind of uh, discipline under fire uh, in those hearings where she was on camera for so, all those hours and did fairly well with the one exception of a moment that I think we will see in the fall campaign if she's the nominee, when she says in a very petulant manner, oh, what difference does it make anyway, talking about the fact that Ambassador Stevens and others are now dead, unfortunately. I, I think most people will give her the benefit of the doubt on that. Leaders abroad will also understand that it's very difficult sitting in Washington to produce the exact results that you want on the ground in a place like Libya. So I think by and large it will not be a decisive factor in the campaign, but you are going to see ads with that particular moment in it. Where would a President Clinton have difficulties overseas? Um, probably with Russia. I think any American president at this point is going to have difficulties with Vladimir Putin, but she very much uh, put her own stamp on the reset of American-Russian relations, which really stalled out. So I think the Russians will have a little bit uh, more wariness of her than they would for somebody with a clean slate on that. Hillary Clinton did a uh, fairly smart thing as Secretary of State. She understood that this is a very centralizing White House under President Obama and that she had limited room to maneuver, in fact, overseas. One of the reasons that she spent so much time overseas and why John Kerry is spending so much, much time yes. is you can have more influence by going abroad on the Obama White House than you can by staying in Washington because they simply won't listen to you. When, when you're here in, when you're in Washington. So I, I, I think that she, she did a good job of establishing uh, a, enough of a relationship in uh, a number of countries that she, she will have that reservoir of some goodwill and certainly benefit of the doubt that any new president needs in foreign affairs. What about the Middle East? Tough. 
she's been on both sides of that issue to some extent. There was a point at which uh, she was, uh, when President Bill Clinton was building up uh, an effort to bring uh, a lasting peace settlement to the Middle East, and he tried as hard as he could, she was very much well known as being very friendly to Yasser Arafat and to Mrs. Arafat. And she was criticized for that for a while. But then becoming the senator from New York, she has taken a very firm position favoring Israel. So. She starts with uh, something of a clean slate in that she's backed both sides at different times, showing that she's transactional on this as everything else, uh, and that she can expect to try to make a deal. That's an interesting point, transactional rather than ideological. She's, she's a practically based individual in, in terms of how she'd approach foreign policy. Do you, do you think that would be across the board? I think so. I mean, it's interesting that in her campaigns, she has emphasized her rather muscular centrist views on national defense. Uh, she wants an active America, an America that's engaged overseas. Uh, I'm sure she supports the forward de deployment of U.S. forces much more than, say, Donald Trump does. Uh, so I think that she can make that case fairly well that she is in the American mainstream on foreign policy. What about immigration? That's a good question. Um, she's clearly going to be to the left of Trump or any other Republican who gets the nomination on the questions of immigration, and she's built a, a good campaign record um, on immigration from a Democratic standpoint. If you look at her background, it's not clear that she's, until this year uh, in the election campaign, shown a great deal of interest in that question. Uh, but. That's not to say she's been absent from it, it's just that it's not been featured. It would certainly be an issue if we were watching a Trump-Clinton race because of some of the things that, that Trump has said that are, that are very focused and very controversial. Uh, one of the things that the media have been challenged for this year is spending too much time on Donald Trump. Notice what great restraint, we talked about Clinton first, but we've got to change to <laughs> Trump. So with, with a Donald Trump, you have this panoply of things that, that build a wall, make the Mexicans pay for it, don't allow Muslim immigration uh, and, and, and others that go beyond that. The, 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 only, the only thing that intrigues me, and you mentioned Putin, is the possibility of a, a Putin-Trump summit just for the sheer theatrics of it. It would be amazing to see which one of them would show the most chutzpah. Uh, in, in such a summit and, and to see if there would be any results, if Trump really can make a deal with Putin. Uh, there's some personal admiration. They seem to have some similar qualities of showmanship uh, and of making showmanship part of their style, their leadership style and, according to Trump, their negotiating style, that you have to make a show in order to produce results at that kind of summit. It would be uh, um, an amazing thing to cover. It, it would. We might both want to get back <laughs> in the game on, on foreign summitry. Uh, but, but is there a sense that Trump has a grasp of foreign policy? I think that sense is dwindling the more that he talks about foreign policy. Uh, when he encourages um, the Japanese to build nuclear weapons, uh, are South Korea. Uh, he is playing with very d deep and very dangerous history and instincts. We remember what a militaristic Japan did. We remember how European nationalisms exploded into two world wars. And we have to be, I think, very careful. American leaders have to be very careful not to fan those flames again to continue to play the honest broker role that I believe the United States has played in foreign affairs, by and large, since World War II. So you, you're saying that Trump does not have a sense of history, does not appreciate history, or is, is the passage of 70 years a factor? I'm sure it is. The passage of 70 years is playing a big role and in the, the incredible changes the world has gone through in the last 30 years, in this period that we call globalization. Uh, where technology has turned everything upside down. It's turning politics upside down. We see it in this campaign. But you, you, you have to come back to a, an appreciation of what history has taught 
And it seems to me that Trump doesn't do that. He doesn't take it into consideration. He shoots from the hip, and when he's challenged, he'll draw the other revolver and shoot again, rather than acknowledging that he may have been wrong about something. And that's a very dangerous attitude, it seems to me. It, it's one of unpredictability, to be sure. And, and, uh, and allow me, when, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, I was working in Germany, and Helmut Schmidt was the president, or the West German, then West German chancellor. And we talked about why the Europeans were positive about Reagan. And his response was, we know where he stands. And, and Schmidt said, I never knew where Jimmy Carter stood. Uh, so what I'm hearing from you is that the, the, the greatest, perhaps, problem that Trump would have is no one would know where he stands. I think that is going to be a huge problem. Uh, it's, uh, it's one thing to have a little bit of calculated ambiguity in your foreign policy. Richard Nixon famously talked about the mad bomber theory, that he wanted to convince the, the North Vietnamese at that point that he might do anything do. Mm -hmm. to try to frighten them to come to, uh, to an agreement. Uh, but I don't get a sense of that kind of calculation in Trump's pronouncements on foreign policy. Who, who would be the most pleased with a Trump presidency? Uh, abroad, what's striking, Charles, is the similarity in American politics today and European, in particular, politics, where you have far right-wing parties in Hungary, in Poland, and in France, even in Britain, demanding that we close the borders, demanding their countries close their borders, mm -hmm. demanding that trade be changed, that uh, anything foreign is suspect today. That current is running both in the United States and across the Atlantic in Europe. So you, you've got a situation where it is conceivable today, which it was not 10, 15 years ago, that the far right party in France, the, front, the national front, mm -hmm. could win the presidency in 2017 when they have their election. Uh, presumably, Marine Le Pen would be would see Trump as a soulmate uh, because they stand for many of the same things. Uh, so I think you would find on the far right in Europe a welcoming attitude toward Trump. Don't know what the Chinese would make of him. Uh, I think because he singled out China in terms of trade and how we have to change that relationship, uh, I think they would be tempted at the beginning to play hardball with him, mm -hmm. to show him that they can't be pushed around like that. So I don't think they would be very welcoming. Certainly Japan would not, because his pronouncements on Japan and nuclear weapons just raises a whole bunch of domestic political issues that are deadly for any ruling party. Trump, Trump is not a free trader, which is sort of shorthand in, in, in a lot of ways, and, and the Republicans generally are, so he's out of step with his own party in, in, in many ways, but that, that is one of them, the trade issue. I don't think many Americans vote on trade issues, though. Not normally, but the more Trump presents his attitudes on trade as the answer to a lot of problems, how do you get the Mexicans to pay for the wall? He says, well, we'll use trade as a weapon against them. Doesn't say it quite that way, but that's the meaning of what the man says. Same thing with China. Resolve the islands problems that's developed, we'll use trade. Uh, so if Trump is resorting to trade as his foreign policy weapon, I think you'll get a lot of attention on it before we go to the polls in November. What about, uh, the, I mean, this, the, the whole notion, who's gonna build, you go to a Trump rally, who's gonna build the wall, we will, who's gonna pay for it, Mexico, it's, he's created this, this litany. Our, 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 our friend and colleague Kathleen Parker wrote recently, uh, 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 column titled, What Did You Do to Stop Him, Daddy? And making this, this very close comparison to Hitler. Right. Um, is, is that alarmist? I think in this case, it is a comparison you want to avoid as long as you can. I'm not prepared to make it myself, but I can understand that colleagues would. I can understand why Kathleen wrote that comparison. Um, because the, the sentiments are so raw and Trump seems to want to whip them up even more, uh, there's a danger there. 
And if he hasn't crossed that line yet, he's heading right towards it. In Washington, we'll come, let's come home for a minute. We've been talking overseas, but you, you live in Washington. What, what is the sense in Washington of, of a Trump nomination first and, and potential president, presidency after that? Well, the interesting thing to watch in Washington how, is how some of the uh, most vociferous and effective criticisms of Donald Trump come from the Republican conservatives, the conservative establishment, certainly. Uh, Michael Garrison, who is also an op-ed writer for the Washington mm -hmm. Post, was a speechwriter for George W. Mm -hmm. Bush, has been week after week violently attacking Trump's positions. You have to conclude that the Republican establishment has much to fear from a Trump victory. And I think we've seen that in the recent days of these meetings that uh, Trump has had with senior Republicans, the party officials, um, trying to heal some of that. But um, for the Democrats, um, I think there's, it's one of those situations where they keep saying, oh no, Trump's so terrible, while saying, let's hope he gets the That's nomination, right. mm -hmm. uh, because they think he's much easier to beat. The uh the, the events of, of essentially the past week or so where Trump was, was uh, talking about penalties for women who have abortions. It struck me, and, and I could be off on this, that he's, he's offended the Mexicans, he's offended uh, Muslims, but when he started talking about women in that context of, of, of abortions, he, he may have tipped the balance, that that may have been the straw for, for even Republicans. And, and then this series of meetings within the party that you mentioned took on a different nature, a different tenor. Is that a fair assessment? I think that's fair. Um, of course, we've all said, or at least I have said half a dozen times before, he's gone too far this time. And he comes back and is doing much better in the polls as a result of his very confrontational style. I mean, clearly, for all the criticisms I make of him and my colleagues make of him, he is touching some nerve with uh, a sizable part of the Republican electorate. The real question is, I think, if you, if you look again, comparing America to Europe, for example, is, can he get control of the Republican Party, the Republican apparatus? Mm -hmm. Because that's never happened before in American history. We've had populist movements, and Trump is the leader of a populist movement in this country now. Um, we've had populist movements come and do very well and get absorbed into the mainstream of the Democratic or the Republican Party. They haven't captured control of the party's command and control system. What if somebody representing this populist trend, this, in my view, quite destructive trend, what if they become the person who is in charge of the party? Will we see a, uh, an implosion of the Republican Party? Many people are predicting that. I'm not so sure. We could see the beginning of a period in American history where you have a very alienated but stubborn right-wing anti-immigration, anti-foreign party that endures uh, decades. That's, that's happened in Europe. And a, and a sitting president is nominally the head of the party. There's, there's an apparatus there, but, but that doesn't outweigh uh, the individual who sits in the, in the Oval Office. So, But if you've got a man who, as you pointed out, uh, does not subscribe to the basic principles, the basic tenets of republicanism, in charge, that means there's no real party. There's no real control. Well, or, or does it mean the party has to swing his way? Yeah. Or, 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 or fraction or split? Or just go somnolent, somnolent. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where are the junctures ahead? A lot of, us, uh, a lot of people have been writing about a, a brokered convention. Uh, do you see that? I'm not sure I know enough uh, about the current mood of the Republican Party to, to, to really have a, a strong answer for you on that. Uh, I think it's quite possible, and uh, certainly 
I would expect the Republican leadership to do everything in its power to bring about the brokered convention and to deny Trump the, um, the nomination. I there, would expect that. There, there, there are still some junctures. There are still major primaries. Uh, New York and California, which is the biggest pot, is, is one of the last of the primaries. But they're not, uh, and, and every one of these primaries, what we, we often lose sight of is every state's got a different configuration for, for how it awards delegates and, and how those are meted out. There is still the big contingency of, of uncommitted delegates. And one of the key pieces that, that hangs out there is before the convention starts, it has to write its own rules. And that may be the juncture where the party still has some control over the rogue candidate, um, if, if it gets to that. I'm not sure there's a question there so much as a statement, but uh, the party seems to be almost willing it to some kind of a point where they can, where they can still put a roadblock in front of Trump. Well, I think they have to because they have so much to lose. Uh, they are the big first round of losers in a Trump victory because he would rejigger the party, he would uh, re reconform it, uh, and um, I think create a lot of uncertainty for people um, in the Republican Party. Created uncertainty and drama and uh, even a measure of excitement in a campaign uh, for, uh, for the presidency that uh, uh, none of us a year ago would have quite anticipated we'd be having this conversation. We might have been talking about Hillary Clinton in the same same context as we started this conversation, uh, but uh, uh, as as you as you look back on it, uh, just kind of a, a last question here. Where was the failure within the party to come behind a more conventional candidate? I think it's incumbent on me as a journalist to begin my answer by talking a little bit about the failures of the media in this campaign. Uh, because we've seen a uh, media-driven campaign uh, focusing primarily on the, the personality of Donald Trump and the spectaculars that he's created. And the media has not done a good enough job in resisting the temptations to go after ratings, to go after revenue. Uh, and most of my criticism here falls on the television networks rather than the print media, but the print media has not distinguished itself in terms of reporting on this incredible technological change that's happened in the media. It's a, it's a deep subject that we would need another period to, to talk about, but I think the media does not come out of this having demonstrated its best moments. In, in terms of the party uh, and the failure to take him seriously enough. One thing we have to remember is 63% of Republican voters through all of the primaries have voted against Trump. Clearly having 17 candidates to begin with worked in his favor. Other things worked in his favor. But I don't know that you can really criticize the party for not understanding how the media was going to play this, misplay it in my view. Uh, how the, the public reaction was going uh, to be quite so fascinated with the showmanship aspects. Technologic, the technology has changed this country in many ways that we're only beginning to understand, and this particular campaign gives us an incredible window into how technology has changed not only our media, but our politics too. Jim Hoagland, thank you. Pleasure, Charles. For more stories from around our state, visit our website at palmettoscene.org. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We leave you tonight with sights and sounds you'll only find here in the Palmetto State. For ETV and Palmetto Scene, I'm P.A. Bennett. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.
If you want to learn more about this program, check out our website at palmedicine.org. Here you'll find useful links and web-only extras. You can also access full episodes and can suggest stories for us to cover. That's palmedicine.org.